there's this this thing with artists where we feel so much gratitude to be able to do what we love to do uh, that we don't give ourselves the value and worth that we deserve. I think women do have this problem as well. And and I think now and in this moment in time, in this day and age, it's shifting for women. And I feel like it also has to shift for artists. Jennifer, thank you so much for joining us here today. Thank you. Your new movie, Second Act, takes on some pretty meaty workplace topics. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the idea of your career being feeling stuck or barriers, either real or internal, that are stopping people from getting to where they want to get. You have a million projects going on. There's so many different things you can do. Why is this a story that you wanted to tell? I just feel like it's every person. And somebody's like, oh, it's the every girl or the every woman, but it's every person. Mm -hmm. There's a time in all of our lives where we want to get ahead, where we have an ambition, where we want to do more, where we want to succeed further. And, And sometimes we hit a wall and we don't know how to get past it. And we realize at the end of it, you know, hopefully you get to the point where you realize the only thing that's stopping you is you. And you can break through any barrier. But sometimes... That's a long road. That's a hard journey. Have you had that experience? I mean, for me, there's been so many times because, you know, this business is pretty unforgiving Mm -hmm. when it comes to being rejected. You get rejected a lot. I say for the, you know, the 40-something movies I've done, you know, I've gotten 100 no's in between. And and that's that's just the nature of what we do. Maybe 400, you know, who knows at this point. But it's, uh, it's definitely a feeling that I'm familiar with, yeah. One of the interesting parts about the character is that she doesn't have a college degree. She feels left out because she doesn't have a college degree. I'm curious, when you hire people, do you look for degrees? Do you think it's important? It's a yes and no question, right? It's great if somebody has an amazing education. But I know from my own experience and my own life and and, and other people that I, I work with that you don't have to have a degree to have value or to, you know, be of tremendous worth to different businesses, that street smarts, that experience, uh, that just kind of internal kind of creative know-how is just as valuable as a degree. And I think that's what this movie deals with a lot, which which is a great thing because most people don't have the privilege of getting that type of education. I know I didn't, nobody I knew growing up did. And uh, and I and and still a lot of us have been successful. So do you make it a point when you you have so many people working for you or working with right. you, you can make choices about who's on the set with you. Are you looking for degrees? Do you actively go out and look for people who don't have degrees? I never did. I have yeah. to tell you, I never did. I always went more with vibe and energy. Mm-hmm. And to tell you the truth, it, it's really about I'm looking for a hard worker, a hard worker who's not afraid to work like 24 hours a day. Yeah. If that sounds crazy. It's because we are. I am. And everybody who works for me (laughs) as well. And then recently, as I've gotten more into kind of owning businesses and going from a licensing model to an an ownership model, um, I realize I need people who have more business experience. And so, yeah, I've been looking more at that lately. Could you talk a little bit about that, moving from licensing to ownership? What made you make that change and what are you looking for? You know, I've been of the mind a long, long time that— the way it's done in Hollywood and the way artists are, you know, kind of handled and taken care of, that there was something wrong with the fact that we bring, we are the scarce asset and we bring so much to the table and we usually get the smallest piece of the pie. Uh, And without us, nothing can really happen because they need the ideas, they need to perform, they need this, they need the, they need all of this stuff, they need the creative and all that, you know, kind of everybody's adding is the money and kind of money you can get anywhere, in a sense, right? That's that's in, in private equity world and in the business world, it's like, oh, it's just money, right? And you're like, really? It's just money? So I'm actually the thing that you need? You're the product, yeah. Right, you're the product. And and I, I knew there was something wrong. I just didn't know what it was. It wasn't until really Alex came into my life and had such a nice grasp of the business world and so much experience in his own life of, uh, of in real estate and in business and dealing with private equity firms and things like that where he was like, oh, yeah, you're right. It is wrong. And this licensing model that we had been 
doing and, and quite successfully. You know, we maxed out. I, I don't think between me and my team, there was anybody who was doing it in, in a more successful way as far as I'm concerned. We were just, we were hitting on all cylinders. But deep down, I knew that when I made uh, a company uh, almost $2 billion, I, and I only came home with a, literally, I don't even know what the percent, it had to be like 5% of that. It may be less, much less. Um, yeah, much less than that, uh, that there was something wrong. But at the something. time, it must have felt, you, know, you were, you're, uh, you're uh, known for your negotiating skills. You are, you know, you're dri- you drive hard, hard deals that benefit you. Now, when you look back, are there things you said, well, oh, I shoot, really I shouldn't have done weren't. that? Yeah. We really weren't driving hard deals. I think we were the ones who were like, they were like, they were driving the hard deals and getting all the money. And we were kind of like, oh, thank you. Yeah. You know, there's this, this thing with artists where we feel so much gratitude to be able to do what we love to do, uh, that we don't give ourselves the value and worth that we deserve. I think women do have this problem as well. And and I think now and in this moment in time, in this day and age, it's shifting for women. And I feel like it also has to shift for artists. Uh, and, and they need to understand their worth and value as well and what they bring to the table and, and need to own the things that they do as well. How does an everyday person yes. go from... T- take advantage of like this. Myself, uh, like, like yourself, person. absolutely. <laughs> How do you take that ownership idea and apply it to your life? Are there things that you are doing differently now that you think about yourself not as licensing your name but as owning these projects? Yeah, because I, if I come up with the idea for a, a perfume, let's say, and I come up with how I want it to smell— uh, what the packaging is going to look like, I'm putting my name on it, and I'm going to be in all the ads. <laughs> yeah, I can do that myself. Right. You know, I just have to partner up with a lab who can create the fragrance in the way that I want it. I have to get a marketing. You know, you, there's I, I can do it myself and then own part of it instead of licensing it up to some one of the big cosmetic companies or something like this where they make the lion's share of it. Yeah. So it's it's those type of things that were learning curves for me. And by the way, I was very successful with those products and I'm very happy because I learned a lot and um and I think we got the best deal we could have and those those people were very in a sense fair to me but I also now know that I can do it on my own and that I can own it so whatever businesses or any things that I want to share with my fans or consumers that I think I I have enough know-how experience uh and, and creative kind of spark to create something, a product that I think is going to be useful or helpful and put it under my brand, which I think at this point I've built up kind of an equity with people of like, I promise you, if I say something, this is what it is. And right. if I tell you it's this, it's actually a good thing. And I don't, I've been very careful what I put my name on and making sure that it's quality. And so, yeah, I, I feel really good about the fact that we, we've we moved from doing that to to realizing that I can do it in a different way and being able to actually execute that at this time in my life. I saw a, a, a great quote from your significant other, Alex mm-hmm. Rodriguez, um, where he talked about you going direct to consumer with your personal branding. So we've talked about the ownership model, but one of the other things that you've been able to do is cut out the middleman. Right. Forbes lists you as the 53rd highest paid celebrity of the year. <laughs> if you look at the list, one of the things that really sets you apart is that you're not on the list because of a sport that you play or acting or producing. It is, as the trades call you, a multi-hyphenate. You have so many projects going on at mm-hmm. once, they all add up. And there's so many things you could be doing. How are you picking what projects that you want to take on? What 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 you want to launch? What are you saying no to? How do you make that decision? You know, it's hard for me to say no. And it always has been. So I, I've always been this person who takes on a lot. And and because I, I love so many things. And I, I love acting. I love making movies. I also love making television. I love, you know, performing live. I love doing concerts. I love making music. I love being in the studio. So there's so many when opportunities come, it's hard for me to say no. Um, but what I think I've learned and what I'm trying to do now at this point in my life is to say no a little bit more and 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 hone it down to like working smarter mm. instead of working all the time, which was, you know, it gets tiring. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody's like, so how do you do it? And I'm like, right. please stop asking me that question because I don't know. And at some point, it's going to catch up with me. So how are you saying no? I just, it's really about the quality the quality of the projects, like I said, mm-hmm. and, and knowing which ones are going to have the best ROI. Right? And so first I have to love it mm-hmm. and respond to it. And, and creatively, the, the artist in me has to be singing, but also... You know, not taking on something that's going to take up seven months 
and yield this much. Right. And then my whole year is gone. And then I have to like scramble to like make up, you know, everything, you know, the, the deficit in, in other ways and with a lot of other projects that I d don't give me as much passion. And it's been a transitional time, a learning curve over the years. And now I'm at a place like, where I just, I'm really much more particular mm -hmm. and, and, and force myself as much as I love doing so much to say no to the smarter things. It most that changed too when I had my kids. Your career path, as I think, if you look back, you're know, incredibly successful, done a lot of amazing things. But you've had ups and downs in your career. Oh, yeah. When you think back to those downs, how does it? Is this the kind of thing that has a um, is a hangover effect on you, where you're like, oh, I don't ever want to go through that again? How do you use those those points in your career which weren't great? You know, I just I look at them now and I think you really just plowed through those. You know, and that's the thing. It's like you can't stop. You have to kind of keep on going. Failure is not falling down and making a mistake or choosing the wrong movie or doing the wrong thing at the wrong time. It's stopping. Stopping is the failure. Not continuing forward is the failure. Not keeping going. And so we don't listen to our gut enough telling us this is not the right thing for you right now. Um, you're doing this out of fear instead of out of love. That's usually when it went, winds up in misery. That's the thing I think that is the best thing to think about in those moments. It's like, am I, am I doing this because I'm afraid of something or am I doing this because of love? And usually that'll, that'll set you on the right path. You must have people asking you all the time how to be the next Jennifer Lopez. What kind of career advice do you give people? You know, it's hard because there is no one set path for any one successful person. Like, I feel like everybody takes a different path. Like, there's no actors that I talk to that go, oh, we all started at acting school, and then from there we did plays, and then from plays we went to television. There's like no one way to do it. You know, I started as a dancer, and then I thought I was going to do Broadway, and I didn't, and I did some tours abroad, and then I came back here, and I got a job as Fly Girl on In Living Color, and then I started studying acting, and then from there uh, I got my first television show, my first development deal, and then from the, you know, and then from there I got my first movie. And it, it just... It, there was a, a process to it that I couldn't have predicted or planned or have said, I'm going to do this, 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 and this. It just all happened the way it happened. And I think all you can do is know where you want to go and take steps every single day in that direction, whatever that is, getting better at what you do. And I think that gets you there. Where that will take you, I cannot tell you. Um, but I do know that if you just wake up every day and go, this is what I'm going to do, this is what I'm going to be, and today this is the thing that I'm doing to kind of keep going in that direction, eventually you will get there. Do you think that your character in the movie does that? I think that she's given up a little bit. I think she's gotten to the point in her life where she's been at this you know, value club shop for 15 years. And for six years, she's been the assistant manager and she knows she deserves a promotion and she's made the store better and she adds all this value. And at the end of the day, she's looked over by somebody who has a, you know, an Ivy League degree. And that uh, really is her last blow. And I know I've had that in my career and that was after I was successful. So that is is a really true honest thing that everybody can relate to of where you get stuck, you know, and almost give up. So is there one particular takeaway you want people to have when they leave the theaters? I think my favorite thing that people have said is that they leave the theater inspired. Mm. They leave the theater inspired. Uh, and, and that's my favorite thing about being an artist in general, is that you can inspire people to dream their own biggest dreams. That's great. Well, Jennifer, thank you very much for joining thank us. You. This is terrific. Thank you so much.